All right, so we are in chapter 22 to the end. Uh, in the beginning, I was going to have a different icebreaker. I was going to ask, uh, what do you think is the biggest problem in today's world? Maybe you might say different things like certain teachers, summer school, um, violence, racism, and wars. Maybe you might say a lot of things. Um, but I'm willing to argue that maybe the source of all those things is sin, and the result of that sin is that all of us, not just the evildoers who um, engage in school shootings or terrorism, but everyone stands in judgment before a holy God. And I think if you grew up in the church, you might know, well, the solution is Jesus died for our sins so that we can go to heaven. That's true. I mean, that, that's the gospel in a sentence, but... That's almost like someone, I guess, asking you, hey, how was that new Spider-Man movie? Um, and if all you said was, oh, well, the good guys win. That's true, but the more you understand how a movie unfolds, you see the scenes, the climax of the movie, the more that you can actually appreciate um, the actual movie. And I think it's the same with the gospel. Yes, it's true that Jesus died for our sins, and because of that, we can be saved. Um, that's in a nutshell... But I think the more you understand what actually happened on that cross, it helps us appreciate it so much more. So with that, I want us to see um, what happens. And so if you have your Bibles, which if you don't, there's some in the shelf over there. Turn to John chapter 13. John chapter 13, go ahead. Hey, I remember you used to have that Bible. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you good, Daniel? John chapter 13. All right, John chapter 13, we're only going to read actually one verse. So um, I'll read that, and then we'll unpack that a little bit. So this was in the chapter, of course. John chapter 13, verse 1 says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. We can stop there. So at this point, actually, your chapter described Jesus' earthly ministry, um, that he had been suffering in three ways, or he had been afflicted in three ways. Um, and if you guys remember, on one end, it was physically, Jesus was often tired and hungry. Uh, second, relationally, Jesus was often misunderstood and mistreated by his friends and family. And thirdly, publicly, Jesus was cornered and accused by the religious elite. That's what uh, the author um, describes in, in your book, how, what Jesus went through. Um, so Jesus' ministry, it was only a three-year earthly ministry. It was around maybe 30 years old when he actually began preaching and proclaiming the gospel. He had a whole life up until then. And sometimes I think it's crazy that one time Jesus was actually your age. He might have been in your school if you lived back then, which is really crazy to think about. Um, but in this three-year ministry, Jesus realizes he is at the last hour. He is in the final hour, and he chooses to love them to the end. I want us to look, um, verse 1 again. So look at the final, I guess towards the end of the last phrase. He says, having loved his own who are in the world. That phrase, his own, I think it's important to recognize that the love of Jesus, as we've been talking about the whole year, um, his sacrifice is for the elect, the chosen, God's chosen people. So the ones that God has chosen and delivered into the hands of Jesus, 
those are the, the ones, past, present, future, and history, that Jesus would die for. And it's almost like a past, having loved his own. That's like a past description. But now it goes into the future tense in the final phrase, he loved them to the end. It's not the end yet, but he will love them to the end. And so in a, in a sentence, uh, Ortland, the author, he says that what would happen to the cross is that God would funnel the cumulative judgment for all the sinful people, all, for all the sin of his people onto one man, Jesus. So you can imagine every uh, Christian or believer in all of history, not just now, not just in FCBC, but that lived thousands of years ago, that will live in the future, all of their sins are now directed onto one man, Jesus. That is what is happening on the cross. I want to give, give us a maybe even closer picture of this. So um, turn to Isaiah, actually. Isaiah 53. We're going to see this go into even more, more detail. And that's in the Old Testament. Isaiah 53. Isaiah. I got a Bible. <laughs> <laughs> <You> tired, bro? <laughs> Stay awake. <laughs> Isaiah 53. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so Isaiah, obviously it's in the Old Testament. Um, you can tell by in your Bible, this was written around 740 to 680 BC. So that's about 600 or seven years before the time of Jesus. Um, so Isaiah was a prophet and he speaks of a time where someone known as a suffering servant would be pierced for the sins of the entire world. Um, so verses 4 to 6 is the heart of this passage. Um, I always thought verse 2 was really interesting because if we were always wondering, like, hey, what does Jesus look like? Is he like a white guy with like blonde or brown hair, like a surfer dude? But actually, look at verse 2 at the end. It says that he had no former majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. So Jesus is probably like a 5 out of 10, like, appearance-wise. Um, he'll probably look like that in heaven. But I don't know. That's kind of like, maybe that's like, I don't know, crushes your dreams if you're like, oh, I wonder what Jesus looked like. But he probably was very average looking. Um, and right now he's still on earth, or no, he's still in heaven, and he's still a human in heaven. So I really often wonder, like, what would Jesus look like when I see him in heaven? But... So average looking dude, Jesus, the Messiah of the world, this is... The heart of the passage in verses 4 to 6, let me read that about the suffering servant that we'll see. Verse 4 says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds... We are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. I want us to notice in verse 4, look at the end of verse 4. Who is it that actually executes the suffering servant? Yeah, it is Jewish authorities that we see in the New Testament, but actually says smitten by God. God is the one who sends Jesus. It's not that Jesus is holding on to heaven, he doesn't want to leave, and he gets kicked out. Um, God sends his son Jesus to be the suffering servant who will bear our griefs and our sorrows. So it's not that the cross was plan B. It was plan A. God intended to send his son to die for the sins of the world. And we see in verse 5 that he was pierced for our transgressions. Transgressions just means any act that goes against God's law. And then he was crushed for our iniquities, iniquities, immoral behavior. So this long foretold suffering servant would bear the sins of God's chosen people. And so let's go even more specific. On that day when Jesus was crucified, this whole time, 
the existence of Jesus, well, he never had no beginning or end. But this whole time, Jesus always had the full pleasure and favor of the Father. But now he's going to experience something that he's never experienced before. Uh, It is crucifixion. He's never experienced that before. But something even more drastic and more devastating, Jesus would experience the displeasure of his Father. The anger and wrath of his Father that he had never experienced ever in paradise and heaven and in his time on earth. But now on the cross, Jesus would only know rejection, abandonment, condemnation, and wrath. That's something Jesus had never experienced before. And I I want to argue that it was more than the physical pain that crushed Jesus. It was the wrath of God for the sins of the entire world. And I think uh, Dane Ortland alludes to that um, as well. I want us to make a really short diagram. Um, So we know that uh, the Trinity is Father, Son, and Spirit. Three persons, one God, very difficult to wrap your head around. But in eternity's past, they always had love and unity for one another. They are not the same. Three persons, one God, for all eternity. Before the universe was even created... Sometimes I wonder, what was God doing before the universe was created? Was he bored? Was he just kind of walking around? But that's not true. God, doesn't, God didn't create humanity because he was bored and needed someone to hang out with. And before anything in the universe was created, the Father, Son, and Spirit existed in perfect harmony. Like the perfect three best friends, if I can say it like that. I hope that's not insulting to what they are. But it describes the, the relationship they all had with one another But at the cross, instead of love, the father and son, there was, not the right needer, there was wrath and anger from the father to the son. That, in the history of history, that had never happened before. But on the cross, this is what should have happened. But why did Jesus do that? Because if it's not Jesus who is here... It is you. It's you and me. If Jesus was not the one who died on the cross, it would have been you. So when we sin, somebody has to die. Somebody has to face face the wages of sin, which is death. It's either you or it's Jesus. And that's why we're always saying that's by faith alone. It's not that you earn your way into heaven. If it's Jesus who receives the wrath of the Father when we trust in Jesus, we're merely hanging on to the sacrifice that Jesus has already committed and went through. So we are united to Christ in his death and his life and his resurrection. And that's why when you exercise faith in Jesus, his sacrifice is imputed and transferred to you. That's why as a Christian, you're not the one dying on the cross. You're not the one dying for um, your sins. It's Jesus. It's just faith that you cling on to, and that's why you're declared righteous. The righteousness of Jesus is transferred to you. And I think that's why somebody had to die 2,000 years ago. If it wasn't you, it's Jesus. If it's not Jesus, it's you. And that's something we really have to think about. Again, God funnels the cumulative judgment for all the sins of his people onto one person, Jesus. And I think the more we reflect and treasure on that truth that every sin you've ever committed, maybe last night, a couple years ago, and every sin that you'll commit in the future, tomorrow, tonight, five years from now, and not just your sins cumulatively throughout your whole life, but the sins of every believer here, every believer in Walnuts, in California, America, the world, also in the past and the future, That is all coming down on Jesus on the cross. And it's a beautiful thing when you really recognize and appreciate what actually happened. And again, we ask ourselves, why did Jesus do this? Well, again, John 13, 1, having loved his own, he loved them to the end. It's love. It's not duty. You're like, okay, Father, I know I have to do this. It's love. Jesus, out of his love for you, He dies for you. And if you truly understand that, your life will change. 
I think when I think about Sunday school and sermons and everything, I always want there to have an application. It, all, it should always impact your heart. If it only changes your head knowledge and you walk out of Sunday school or church and nothing changes in your life, uh, we would have failed. And I think for me, the, one of the easiest applications I always go to is prayer. When we pray, when we respond to God after hearing his word, that's one of the most easiest ways we can apply this in our life. So um, I'm going to lead us in probably three short segments of prayer, but I want us to maybe um, keep a diagram in mind. Um, so maybe every person... We have a past, and we have a future. We know our past. It's our life. We might not have the best memory, but we have a past. But we don't know our future. And through certain prayer segments, I want us to reflect on our past, our, our, um, our future, and just the grand scheme of things. So there will be three segments in this time. But what I first want us to think about is our past. Um, if you're like me, you may have done things in your life that you truly, truly regret that maybe you're horrified that you've done certain things, uh, maybe when you weren't saved or maybe when you were saved, but yet in your fallenness, you still went through with that thing. Um, I think about the ways I've hurt certain people in my life, and I sometimes wonder, God, have you still, uh, I know you forgive me, at least I trust that, but I still feel really horrible about the way I hurt this person in my life, this friend, or this action I committed. I think we all have these dirty secrets in our closet that we don't really want to share with anybody. Do we truly believe God loves us in that moment, that he forgives us? Um, So we all know our past. Um, So I'm going to reread the verse, John 13, 1. I want to give us a moment of just prayer and to just pray to God. You can see it maybe as confession, but maybe tied to what Jesus did on the cross, that he bore the wrath of our sin. So... Let's actually go into prayer now. Feel free to close your eyes if that, that helps you. Um, let me reread John 13, 1. And I want us to reflect on our past sins. So John 13, 1 says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. So with your eyes still closed, just reflect if there is a sin maybe in the past that maybe you're not truly sure if God will truly forgive you because of how horrible it is or maybe of how, how much it occurs that you commit the sin in your life. Remember that Jesus, he paid for your past, present, and future sin on that cross and he is eager to forgive you if you will go to him. Remember the heart of the father, like the father from the parable of the prodigal son. So take a moment now to accept his forgiveness for you, to take hold of that, to trust in that. So I'll give us about maybe 30 seconds to a minute. Lord, as we approach you, we recognize that there are things in our life that we dare not utter out loud to another person, maybe because we're so ashamed of ourselves and we don't want people to discover the truth about us. 
But Lord, you know the truth about us. And we know that it's while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You sent your son to die for us. Help us to truly allow that truth to sink to the bottom of our hearts so that we can take hold of that forgiveness and that we could repent and become more and more like you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so that's the, uh, the past. I don't want us now to think about the future. So we don't know the future. I don't know what's going to happen tonight. I don't know if there's going to be a crazy event in the world. I don't know if the Warriors will win. Um, I wish I could know. I hope they win, sadly. Um, but there are a lot of things in the future that we don't know. We don't know what college we're going to. We don't know what job we're going to get. We don't know um, the person we're going to marry. We, um, we don't know where we're going to live house-wise. We don't know um, a lot of things. And sometimes our parents in society, they ask, what are you going to do with your life? And you're like a freshman or a sophomore. like, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just me. And sometimes the future can really be, uh, it makes us anxious. It makes us nervous. But if you're reading the book towards the end, Dane Ortland says that our future is secure because heaven is our home. If you know these questions in this life, they're real questions, but after you pass through this life, if you know that heaven is your home, there is security in that. There are ways where you can have peace because heaven is your home. So let me read again John 13, 1. There might be different things that stick out to you from that verse, and I'll give us another moment to, to uh, bring our future worries to God and trust that if heaven is your home, if you're a believer, you can have peace. So John 13, 1 again says this. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who are in the world, he loved them to the end. Take a minute now in prayer. If you don't often think about heaven, that should be a daily practice, or at least a consistent practice to remember that this earth is not your home. One day there will be a day in a place where the Lord Jesus will wipe every tear from your eye and heaven is your home. So take a minute now to just treasure that truth. Lord, as we come before you, we acknowledge that the future is uncertain and we have no idea what will happen even tomorrow or even in the next hour. And God, yet we still have anxieties about what college we will go to, what classes we will take, what grades we will end high school with, uh, the job we'll have in the future. Lord, these are all, in the grand scheme of things, short-term goals if we will exist forever after we die. 
Lord, help us to be comforted by the truth that heaven is our home. We will dine with you at the heavenly banquets. We will be with you and see you with our very own eyes. We will have all our tears wiped away. You will cleanse us of every sin. We will have glorified bodies. We will be with you in heaven, and each day in heaven will be better than the last. Lord, I pray that that would impact the way we live on earth now, that we would not store up treasures on earth, but we would store up treasures in heaven. It will get here sooner than we think, Lord. Help us to remember um, our, our true home. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> okay, our final uh, prayer topic. So we did the past, we did the future. But what about now? I think now, I think one of the biggest needs or desires of any human, in addition to like food, clothing, shelter, uh, it's love. It's acceptance. It's will I truly be loved by somebody? And I think... We all look for love in the wrong places if that's the only way we look for it. For example, if we look for love through um, a boyfriend or a girlfriend, and that's your ultimate sense of love, uh, that is an infinite expectation on that person. If you look for love and being affirmed by your success, well, that's a recipe for a hamster wheel type of life where you're always trying to succeed to uh, feel validated by the people around you. Um, we all look for love in the wrong places. But if you truly know that Jesus died on the cross because he loves you and he infinitely loves you, you can be eternally secure in his love. And I don't think we spend as much time reflecting on that. Consider this question. If you knew, if you're, if you're a believer and you're genuinely saved, if you knew, Romans 8, that nothing could separate you from the love of God, nothing in all creation. How would that actually change the way you go about your life? How would that change the way you might even try to receive love from other people? Maybe it's less about receiving love from people and it's not about you loving other people as a selfless act. True love does change your life, but it's the true love that comes from Jesus and his death on the cross. So let me read John 13, 1, one final time as we understand the love of our Savior. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who are in the world, he loved them to the end. Take a moment now and recognize that this verse, having loved his own, this refers to the elect chosen believers from the Father that includes you. This verse is talking about you if you are saved and if you have believed. That Jesus loved his own, his chosen ones in the world, and he will love them. He will love you to the end. Take a moment to just treasure and find yourself secure in his love.
Lord, as we come before you, Lord, we confess that our hearts, we often look for love in all the wrong places. And because of that, we're often disappointed, we're often frustrated, and we're often empty when we put our eggs in one basket of trying to find love in things that do not satisfy. Help us to know, Lord, that the, um, that the strongest, most beautiful display of love was your death for us on the cross, your resurrection, and how you continue to love us today, and you will tomorrow. Lord, I pray that if we don't feel loved in life, we feel forgotten, neglected, not affirmed, help us to know that we find that acceptance and love and embracing through your love on the cross, and that we are now adopted sons and daughters of the one true King, our Heavenly Father. Lord, may that truth frame our life now and forevermore. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.